Good afternoon, Buster. How are you today? I'm doing very well. I'm glad to be with you, Margie. Can you tell me your full name? Because people call you Buster, and based on your rich, beautiful career, I have to believe you were given a different name at birth. Yes, my name was, uh, is Franklin Lee Hagenbeck, but I was born in uh, French Morocco. From My dad uh, was po posted there in the Navy. My older sister came running into the French hospital saying, where's that Buster boy? And it stuck with me forever. And my mother kept, kept waiting for me to grow up and uh, become the Franklin whom she named me after Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, and you can see it's not happened yet. Hardly. The, the career you've had is every bit of the career of Franklin D. Roosevelt. What, what I'd like to hear about is, first of all, how long have you been a member of the Rotary Club of Jacksonville? I've been a member of the Rotary Club now. I've just finished my fifth year. And when you came in, what, at what part of your career were you? I had just retired uh, one year earlier of, after 39 years on active duty in the U.S. Army. In what positions? You can start from the beginning. I think a lot of our Rotarians don't really know exactly what it is that you did and what you do. So maybe just tell us the story. Okay. Yeah, I, was, uh, I mentioned I was born in uh, Morocco. When I was one year old, we moved here to Jacksonville. My dad's last 10 years in the Navy were stationed here at either at uh, Naval Air Station Jacksonville or at Mayport when he would go to sea on the carrier. So uh, I went to the local schools here, never had to move, uh, even though I was a military brat. And when it came time for me to think about going to college, uh, we didn't have much money. So I was thinking about and told my dad I was going to join the Army and then use the GI Bill uh, to go to college. And this was at the height of Vietnam. And he could convince me that I ought to apply to the military academies, both the uh, Navy and uh, West Point, which I did. And back in those days, they were taking anybody, so uh, I got into West Point, uh, graduated four years later, and uh, was commissioned uh, into the infantry, and then went on active duty and stayed on for 39 years. I married a local guy here from Jacksonville. We had gone to school together, and we decided we'd uh, stay in the Army as long as we liked it. And it started out uh, awfully good. My first posting was in Hawaii, mm. and we stayed there the better part of uh, almost five years. And then I went to a variety of other schools from, that you progressed through in the Army, from the career course at uh, infantry career course at Fort Benning, Georgia. And from there, uh, I was scheduled to go to the 82nd Airborne Division. And at the last minute, they changed direction. And they said, no, we want you to go to a fully funded graduate school uh, and then go in, uh, up to West Point. So I did that. I got my master's degree at Florida State. And while I was there, I was able to uh, coach defense events with Coach Bobby Bowden. Uh, I joined his staff uh, after his very first year down there and served with, with him for two years. And the big joke was that I was the second highest paid guy on the staff. Uh, he got the most money, I think it was about $37,000, $38,000, and I was still getting paid as an Army captain. So uh, it worked out pretty sweet. And I went from the, there after graduating uh, with a master's. In what? What did you get the master's in? Uh, I got it in uh, It was really what they call uh, kinesiology back then. But uh, they changed the names every once in a while for it. But it was a master's science degree. Uh, and I went back to coach, which I did for three years and had a wonderful time. And from there, I did get back to, to the 82nd. I went to Fort Bragg after that for three years. Uh, then was selected to go to Commander General Staff College at, uh, in Kansas. And just before I left the 82nd, the one-star general that was there said, look, he was going to be posted to the Pentagon, and he would like me to, uh, to come work for him when I graduated from Leavenworth. And it sounded like a good deal. And I was out at Leavenworth in November due to uh, graduate in June. And... I got a call from a buddy of mine who was in the personnel business and he said, would you rather go to, to Australia than to the Pentagon? So I thought long and hard for about a second and a half and uh, took the Australian uh, assignment, which was the, uh, a liaison officer to their infantry center. And what came from that about a week afterwards, this general called me and said, uh, look, I can't tell you if you made the right decision or not, but just think about how many uh, Australian officers will be on your next promotion board. So. I didn't think about that too long, and we went on to Australia, had a wonderful time, came back. Wait, when you were in Australia, were you able to pursue your passion for baseball? Uh, not so much. The, uh, when we were down there, I learned how to uh, play cricket, not very well, but I did play rugby with them because I played a little bit of rugby at uh, West Point, and I'd been on the Army team uh, at Fort Benning, and uh, they let me play. Believe me, I did not have the talent that those characters have and do have today. They're awfully good. So that was a lot of fun staying down there, but they did drag me back to the Pentagon from Australia. So that was the first of four times that I was signed in the Pentagon, initially into the personnel business, which I had no background in whatsoever. Uh, 
But I came and went from there. I ended up commanding an infantry battalion in the 10th Mountain Division uh, for two years, stayed on to be the operations officer for the division. Isn't that amazing? I left there to go to the Army War College. Then I commanded a brigade uh, out in uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And that's when I got linked back up with the St. Louis Cardinals, whom I had a passion for. My dad had been born in St. Louis. And uh, I had actually been a bat boy during spring training for when they were uh, in spring training down at uh, St. Petersburg. And How did you ever get that job? Well, I got the job the easy way in those days. I was going down there with my dad for two weeks. He was taking a series of uh, tests for, to be certified from selling real estate to mutual funds and a whole bunch of different things. And he would drop me off at the ballpark in the morning and pick me up at the end of the day. And I guess he thought they were kind of babysitting me because I was only 11 years old at the time. But I had a time of my life. And uh, I went up to St. Louis later that summer for about six weeks. And, did when they were at home stands, I was able to be a bat boy there as well. But I had had no contact with them until 1993 when I went back out to uh, to St. Louis and uh, I was at a social one evening. It turns out to be that the editor of the uh, the paper, St. Louis Dispatch, was there, and he didn't identify himself and he thought that I was BSing. So he went back to the Cardinals front office to check it out. Of course, it turned out to be true. I got linked back up with the Cardinals. Uh, met everybody and have had a, uh, a wonderful experience with them and to this very day. In fact, when I retired in September of 2010, uh, they held a, uh, a retirement ceremony and a hundred of my closest friends in St. Louis and they picked up the tab for all of it to include uh, the, the suites and the seats and everything that was there other than travel for most folks. So I even brought some Navy guys out there with me. So That's amazing. It was a great relationship. It really hit it off well. Across all lines. Yep. And I went back after that assignment at uh, Leonard Wood and was reassigned to the 10th Mountain Division as the Chief of Staff. And while I was the Chief of Staff, I got picked up for uh, Brigadier General, one star. And had, a, had about four different jobs as one star. And then five weeks before 9-11, uh, I left there with my second star and took command of the 10th Mountain Division at Fort Drum. In five weeks after 9-11, I got notified to send the 1st Infantry Troops into Afghanistan and to pre prepare my headquarters to go. So I, I went shortly thereafter in the fall of 2001 and was a senior commander in Afghanistan for that uh, first year of the, of the war. And we took down the Taliban, of course, along with unconventional uh, troops as well, and then had the largest uh, conventional fight up to that point uh, that we'd had since Vietnam called Operation Anaconda, which went after the far and Al-Qaeda along the uh, Pakistan border. And from that job, I got promoted to a three-star, became personnel chief for three years, and then my most enjoyable assignment I ever had, I went from there uh, as a superintendent of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. So I retired from that position and came back to Jacksonville. Now, when you went overseas at this later time of your life, I'm sure this was the last thing you or your wife expected would happen. Am I correct? We didn't expect my division at all would go because what happened on that uh, that day, I had actually flown down on a military aircraft that morning before the attacks, uh, landed at Fort Bragg where I was due to have a brunch with my counterpart, the Commanding General of the 82nd Airborne Division, John Vines, and when I was getting off the aircraft, the escort officer that picked me up told me about the, uh, the attacks on the Twin Towers. And I certainly didn't expect to be going because half my division was training right then for the deployment to go into Bosnia and Kosovo and peacekeeping duties. And we thought the 82nd Amazing. would go because that's typically what they do. They're the you know, reaction force for our army. So I was a little bit surprised and uh, it turned out to work out very well though. In fact, as I understand it, West Point in your lifetime recently named a room after you, am I correct? Yeah, I got really lucky. I thought they named things after you were dead, but uh, instead they did a, uh, an executive suite at the hotel that's located at West Point. And they sure did. They uh, honored me with that, uh, which they have with other graduates before, but I'd been selected about a year earlier as a distinguished graduate from the academy. I, I'm sure that played a part into that, and uh, they really did a nice job. What do you think was the single most compelling reason why they chose to name a room at West Point after you in your lifetime? Well, I think that they wanted to capitalize on the fact that uh, I'm still associated with West Point. I sit on their board, so I get up there three or four times a year, and I can help uh, continue to market West Point as the institution that it is, as well as the hotel. And so I think it's a drawing card for them. And you said that uh, after graduate school, which you did not plan to study personnel at all, you ended up in the personnel arena, having no prior background. And I believe, if I'm correct, 
you're very heavily engaged in leadership training right now. And if you wouldn't mind, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I mean, I, I got immersed into leadership because that's really what the West Point experience is. It's to produce uh, leaders of character. That's their mission in life. And so you get immersed as a cadet, you go in the Army and you learn how to do uh, expand upon that in many different ways. So when uh, I retired, I was invited uh, first by the University of Florida and then later, of course, by this, it's called the Thayer Leader Development Group at West Point uh, to give presentations in leadership. Also, a number of, I went through Corn Ferry, which is a search firm, and a lot of executives uh, across and do executive leadership things, like with J.P. Morgan and Barclays and other places. And so I started out doing those kinds of things initially. Uh, but after about a year or two of that, uh, I didn't like all the traveling, and I, I didn't particularly care to be given presentations and never seeing the people again. So I got associated to stay only with two, and I became, three years ago, the director of the Engineering Leadership Institute at the University of Florida. So that's really nice. I mean, reconnected with students, both graduates and undergraduates. I'm able to, to oversee that, really the vision, the strategy, get the students involved and all that, and then I have a couple of people who work every single day engage. Well, I typically go down uh, once a week when the, the days that they're given the classes and get to engage with the uh, students. So, And this is in the engine part. school there? It's under the engineer, College of Engineering, but other students from other colleges also attend those classes. And they get leadership training for what period of time? Well, they'll take it first semester. We have a variety of different courses that they have, from basic leadership courses where they teach you the theory, the concepts, uh, all the way up to a leadership practicum, if you will, where you get hands-on experience. You get credit as a student, uh, three credit hours for actually doing projects, building teams and leading them. And uh, the students have really helped us build the curriculum, and they really love it. And they're the ones that socialize it and market it, and uh, we're getting more students than we can handle at this time. In fact, we're under discussion with the dean about how to expand our capacities. Terrific. Amazing. And you joined Rotary. Why? Why did you join Rotary? And why the Rotary Club of Jacksonville? Well, I was very fortunate. I was very lucky in it in that I uh, came back here and somehow uh, the Navy folks found out that there was a retired three-star in the area and I got invited to go to a, a brunch at Naval Air Station Jacksonville. They conduct one, once a quarter. And so I went out there and of course at that time I think I was the, uh, the only Army guy. <laughs> Naturally all the rest were uh, from the Navy and a couple Marines. And uh, I w met two wonderful guys, uh, John Fryer, retired two-star in the Air Force, uh, and also uh, Admiral Jonathan Howe, retired four-star. And we really hit it off well, and they're the ones that sponsored me to, to join the Rotary. And now that you are a retired Army three-star, you seem to still spend a significant and compelling amount of time with our administration. It's confidential, I'm sure, but can you talk about it at all, some of the meetings that you are still engaged in where you fly up to Washington? I do. I say engage with them, usually with uh, the Chief of Staff of the Army. At one point, they're the Chairman, of course, because he was an Army buddy of mine. And uh, it's been very, very good. I've been able to bring a few of them down here to speak in, on different occasions, uh, whether it was to the World Affairs Council or some other venues. Uh, I got wrapped up in the spring of 2011, just about six months after I uh, retired, and was asked to join a brand new group called the Elbow Group out of the Belfer Center at the JFK School at Harvard. And it's comprised of six Americans and six Russians. And on each side we have four retired three or four star generals and two members from CIA or the KGB. So we're all retired and we met for the first time in the spring, as I mentioned, of 2011 in Istanbul. And we started and the primary focus was counter-nuclear terrorism. And the administration there at Harvard uh, handles putting everything together and we reach agreement and meet every eight or nine months on a variety of topics. So we've met in places like Lisbon, uh, we've met in Cyprus, we've met in Jerusalem, we've met in Berlin. In fact, we met in Berlin on the uh, 70th anniversary of Soviet uh, soldiers and American soldiers meeting for the first time during World War II on the River Elba, just north of Berlin in Torga. And we actually have become friends, if you will. And so we have met in the Bahamas, uh, a couple of other places. We're due to meet in Malta here after our new president's uh, inaugurated. And we tr really what we're trying to do is recreate protocols that existed during the Cold War that prevented it from becoming a hot war, a kinetic war. And I was unaware of most of those protocols until uh, these meetings began. And 
We had started talking about Syria and Iraq and Iran very seriously in the summer of 2012. And we came up with a plan in which we advocated uh, the way of the way ahead in this particular area. This is when I knew they were very uh, influential is after the last day uh, of our meetings, Putin flew down to be debriefed by them. <laughs> and so he's connected directly with them. Unfortunately for us, we have to go through what we call the interagency. So initially, uh, we would put together and still do a 10-page paper, white paper we call it, on our points. We try to find common ground, and we found quite a bit. And we get it back to uh, the ver uh, variety of agencies uh, in D.C. So initially I was given mine to the Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates, whom I knew pretty well. And after that, when he left, I was given to Secretary Clinton because I'd known her having been at Fort Drum, New York. She was a senator from New York and had met her through those times and continued to do that. And then our intel guys get it back to the CIA and the, the uh, FBI and others. So it gets widespread attention, but there's not a single point of contact like there is with the Russians. So we haven't done, in my view, from the United States perspective, the things that we could have done to mitigate some of the dilemmas that exist uh, in the Mideast right now. So we'll keep working at it. Are there any things that you'd like to talk about that you think we should be doing, or um, if not, if it's confidential? No, I can talk in, in broad terms. I think that the uh, the area that's over the Middle East is in turmoil. It's going to remain in turmoil for quite some time. It's literally a, a civil war between the Sunnis and the Shias. There's some other outlying uh, pieces and parts that are there. Uh, we in America don't really grasp uh, the history of that region. I mean, we might understand it in big chunks, uh, but not in, to the level of detail I think it's ne necessary to have a, a geopolitical strategy. And so uh, we have to get some real experts on our side to, to come together and look for common ground as opposed to things that we disagree on. I mean, you can read about the disagreements in any newspaper or on the, the internet, but uh, we do have some common things and we just don't want to see something happen in the Mideast that happened back in 1914 that started World War I with an assassination. And the, the probability of that, that continues to grow, in my view. Hmm. So, in closing, is there anything else you'd like to tell us about um, the things you'd like to do for leisure time? If, is there any leisure time in the, in the life of Buster? Is there? Uh, there's some leisure time, not as much. In my golf game, if you ever played a round of golf with me, you'd realize uh, I didn't take much leisure time. <laughs> uh, so i got to fix that soon here, I think. I just like remaining engaged with the folks, and the opportunities here with Rotary uh, are huge. You know the people that are there. I mean, from all walks of life, but they're the people that run this city, uh, and they're wonderful, and uh, reach out and make a difference in people's lives. So I just like being a part of that. Well, you make a difference in all of our lives, so we're very grateful to have all of the work that you do, and certainly your membership in Rotary is rich. So thank you so much for spending this time with me today. It's my pleasure. Thanks very much, Margie.